Elif Shafak, London Book Fair author of the day. Welcome to the London Book Fair podcast. Thank you. Now, you and Pamuk are the most successful contemporary Turkish authors. How easy was it to find both publishers and a readership outside Turkey for you? I think it's, um, in a way, it's a gradual process. You know, nothing happened overnight or with just one book. What I have experienced in my own personal journey uh, over the years with each and every book, my readers kind of have expanded both nationally and internationally. So I see it as a gradual process. Was there a moment or a book when, you know, in retrospect, you can see that things began to change when your audience began to grow internationally? I mean, I've always experienced it as a, as a gradual process, as an accumulation. But of course, there were certain titles, perhaps, that um, helped me to make that move forward quicker if I may say. One of them was The Bastard of Istanbul. At the time I was living in Arizona. I was commuting between Arizona and Istanbul. So I wrote the, the story of this Armenian family and Turkish family, mostly through the eyes of women, generations of women. That book was very important um, at the time for me. And then Black Milk came out. That was important. The 40 Rules of Love and then Honor. In Turkey, I have more titles out, of course. Of course, uh, yes. I have 11 books in Turkey out. Eight of them are novels, three of them are nonfiction. So um, readers know that I, you know, because I've dealt with very different issues, usually I try not to repeat myself. You know, I'm a very curious person, and every book has been very different. And I see it as a, as a very, very long journey. And of course, you've been in contention for the Orange and the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, and 40 Rules of Love and Honour are now being increasingly taken up by reading groups here, aren't they? Which is a wonderful experience for you, I'm sure. Yes, yes. and, and I, I'm always very excited, you know, when I um, meet people who have actual book clubs, you know, their own uh, book groups. To me, it is, it is so important. We don't have that in Turkey, unfortunately. Um, whereas here there's a very active, you know, readership. Uh, I, I love the way people organize in their daily lives, you know, discuss books, the, the kind of questions they, they raise. The truth is, I don't think novelists know their novels that well. <laughs> a reader, a very careful reader, would know a novel much better than the writer. Because even when that writer's recently finished it, you mean, not, even then, not from and 10 perhaps, years ago? And perhaps especially then. Especially then. Because when we write, we are inside this imaginary world. And I don't think we're very conscious of what we're doing. At least I can speak for myself. You know, you're using parts of your brain, other parts of your brain, and sometimes you don't really know what you're doing. You don't know what's going to happen, you know, six pages later. You don't know what that character is going to do, and you let the characters lead you. So it's not, I think there may be two way, different ways of writing. On the one hand, you can be like an engineer, putting every little detail and, and, and try to situate yourself above the text. But that's not how I write. So for me, writers are not like puppeteers controlling the characters from above with strings. We get lost inside the text. And the careful reader can see the text so well, but she can also see uh, what has changed from one book to the other. So I love listening to readers' comments. You were born in Strasbourg and brought up in Turkey, lived in the States, in Spain, in Germany, and of course now in Britain. Istanbul is central to your writing and you define yourself as Turkish. How important is that to you? How important is that sense of identity? In some ways it's a, it's a tough question for me I and mean, it's a question that I do care about a lot and think about almost on a daily basis. You know, what does it mean to belong? National identities, ethnic identities. I think about identity politics a lot. Uh, I'd like to believe that or, or I'm a strong believer in the possibility of having multiple belongings rather than a strict, you know, frozen or fixed um, sense of identity. I'm more interested in belongings. For me, belongings are more fluid, they're more water-like, and you can have multiple belongings, you can have multiple homes. Sometimes you can even have portable homelands. You know, I like to think that it's, things are more fluid, because otherwise, um, identity politics very much relies upon a distinction between us versus them. 
and this hidden belief that us is better than them. And I want to question that dualistic framework. Do you go back to Turkey often? I do go back to Turkey often. Um, it, it, we're, we're partly based in Istanbul, partly based in London. Uh -huh. My husband is a journalist. He's based in Istanbul. So we commute back and forth as a family. The children are here with me. They go to school here. So they're very aware of their, of their dual lives and their dual yes, identities. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yes. And children are much more open to such experiences, I think, than grown-ups. Yes. As long as emotionally they feel at home and comfortable. Um, I, I love commuting between cities, cultures and languages as well. As they do in Istanbul, East and West meet in your work. In what language do you write though? It depends. It depends on the story. I mean, some, there are some stories that come to me mostly in Turkish, some others come to me in English. And I feel connected to each language in a different way. Um, Turkish for me is the language of my grandmother. You know, I have this emotional bond and um, perhaps with English, it's more cerebral, the connection, but I'm, I love this language. English is my third language. It, it wasn't... Um, well, your second is French? I, my second was Spanish, Spanish at the French. time, when I, when I was a child. Um, so what happens is that there are things I prefer to say in English, like when it comes to satire, humour, irony, I find it much, much easier in English, whereas if I'm talking about sorrow, melancholy. I find it easy in Turkish, but I think that's a cultural distinction as well, rather than a linguistic one. Are there more words in Turkish for, for feelings of sadness? Is that one of the... I think there are more words in Turkish for feelings of sadness. Um, just this morning I was thinking, for instance, we have a word called gurbet, which I can't translate into English, even though the English vocabulary is so nuanced, it's so sophisticated. I've been thinking about this word a lot. It's not exactly exile, it is displacement. We have a specific word for that, you know, when you are disconnected from your homeland. And it's, there's, a, there's an amazing sadness to the, wor to, to the word itself. So things like that, I do care a lot about words, not only what we can express, but what we fail to express interests me. What about your journalism? Do you tend to write that in English more than Turkish? Um, I write columns. I mean, I have a lot of respect for journalism and journalists in, in, in general, especially in countries where democracy is not mature. They're doing a very hard job. I don't consider myself a journalist in that sense. No, I can't do what they're doing. But you doing. write journalism. But I write yeah. um, pieces, op-ed pieces, you know, non-fiction. I write about a wide range of issues. Yes. Um, about, I write about domestic violence. I write about politics, contemporary politics, as well as cultural history, mic micro history. Women's issues are very important for me. Minority issues are important. And when I say minority, it could be anything, you know, ethnic, sexual, religious minorities, but also any anyone kind of pushed to the margins of, a, of any social or cultural context. I'm interested in hearing that person's voice and, if possible, bringing that voice to the centre of attention. But do you write that in English or, or Turkish? I do in both. In both? In both. I write right. from time to time for The Guardian Online. I write for The New York Times um, International yes. Edition op-ed pieces. But for, in Turkey, I write regularly twice a week. I have a, a right, bigger so Sunday article. Right, so in Turkish, yes. yes. Yeah, so, yeah. And, 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 and the topics range um, differ depending on the week because Turkey has such a hectic, yes. you know. <laughs> and what language do you dream in? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I dream in both languages, in two languages. Sometimes you start a dream in one language and you finish it in another. Uh, and I'm a big believer in that. I think if we can dream in more than one language, we can write fiction in more than one language. You've written about the writer's conflict to create or report and about the role of literature in helping to break down barriers and uh, allow us to understand each other and embrace each other. As you travel the world, to what extent do you think you and writers like you have made a difference? I mean, we are living in very interesting times, aren't we? I yeah. think we are... Um, being pulled in two completely different directions, opposite directions, if I may say. On the one hand, obviously, the world has become more global, globalized, and this is the, the time of displacements, migrations, movements, and there are more and more people, you know, dreaming in more than two languages, um, who are raising their children as bilingual, multilingual, etc. So on the one hand, we see this, and I think the world has become 
um, more interconnected or perhaps it was always interconnected but we weren't as much aware of this so we are more aware of these connections which is a good thing because I think there's an amazing potential there for empathy and for dialogue and yet at the same time we see the exact opposite and we are being pulled in the completely different direction because it's an age of enormous clashes, xenophobia, bigotry, narrow-mindedness and unfortunately so many stereotypes are being produced and they breed each other. I think Islamophobia breeds anti-Western sentiments somewhere else, anti-Western sentiments breed Islamophobia somewhere else, etc. So I, I believe hardliners in one country without knowing sometimes create more hardliners elsewhere and those hardliners create more hardliners elsewhere and just like that we go on and on in vicious circles. Yes, the younger Elif said she wasn't interested in understanding the world, only in changing it. How do you feel now? Do you better understand it? Um, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the, for the political traditions, mostly from the left, you know, that desire to change the world and make it a more just, fair, place where there's more equality. Uh, I, I don't think that's a desire that can be underestimated. And yet at the same time it's so important to understand the world. And sometimes people forget that. I have forgotten that in my early 20s. To me, to this day, honestly, it's a mystery how I became more interested in mysticism, mystical thought, because this is not how I was raised at all. Um, and when I started reading more about Sufism particularly, because in Sufism understanding the world is such an important asset. Um, I was myself, I had no connection whatsoever with this culture, but I became intrigued, I became interested in the, in the, in the whole philosophy. And today I believe understanding and changing at the same time, if I may, that's what I would rather do. Do the Turks read mostly for education and worship, as is the case often in the Middle East, or do they read for pure pleasure? We have um, an interesting tradition in Turkey. I mean, the novel as a genre is very important. And novelists are usually seen as public figures, which can be good and bad. Yes. Unfortunately, we focus too much on the writers rather than the writing itself. So we don't have a robust literary criticism. I wish there were. But rather than that, we have, you know, we either love our authors or hate our authors. Um, so people are very, very divided when it comes to novelists. And novelists usually assume political roles. In a country like Turkey, you cannot stay away from politics. And oftentimes you don't want to stay away from politics. When I say this, I don't mean, you know, supporting any political party. I don't mean it in that sense at all. But politics in a, in a wide sense. So, for instance, asking questions, these are political questions about memory, cultural amnesia, you know, the past, what happened on this street, in that building, you know, to remember, to help people to remember. These are important questions. What I find in Turkey is, um, which is very moving, on the one hand, we have a very emotional um, readership and usually women like 85% of fiction readers are women and what happens is when I see a male reader I know almost auto automatically a woman has made him read that book either it was you know his girlfriend or wife saying you must read this you must read this and then he gets that book and he starts reading so I do have lots of male readers who have been kind of guided towards my books by the females around them. I guess that's true here too. That's true. I, yeah. I, um, I, I think it, it amazes me and one of the things that makes me happy in Turkey when I look at the you know people waiting in line when there's a book signing usually they're not people who would talk to each other. I have readers from very different backgrounds you know leftists, liberals, um, feminists, Sufis, some of them atheists, some of them very conservative religious. I have lots of women readers who are wearing headscarves, yeah, they come from more conservative families and maybe they wouldn't say hello to each other, maybe they wouldn't break bread together, but the fact that they read the same novel is something that makes me happy. What sort of titles, fiction or non-fiction, make the bestseller lists? People usually like to read uh, um, non-fiction, there's a huge interest in, in non-fiction, and because we are debating identity issues, you know, who are we? Are we Easterners? Are we part of the West? Are we part of the EU? 
Um, there are lots of books about identity politics. Novels are usually being read widely. Crime fiction, historical fiction, I would say. Um, many women authors are quite active, um, but novels mostly, more than short stories and, and poetry. So quite, quite serious books by and large, probably more so quite, than here. Quite serious books. And one of the interesting things about Turkey, we never know the real numbers. So it's yeah. very difficult to compare because there's a black market. There are, you know, lots of books are being pirated yes. um, everywhere. So you can never say, you know, how many copies of that book have been printed and have been read. And I believe the same book usually in Turkey is being read by more than one person. And people always tell me, you know, I read it afterwards, I gave it to my great, great aunt, she sent it to Germany and then the book came back. So you have to multiply every book sometimes uh, by five. Yes, yes. Which is very nice as a reader. It's not, quite, a, so, not quite so good for the royalties, <laughs> but anyway. I assume there are many writers who are published in Turkey who haven't found publishers elsewhere. Do international publishers pay enough attention, do you think, to what's being published in Turkey? Of course, that's true. But in general, what I observe is we read Western literature more than, you know, Westerners read Turkish literature or Middle Eastern literature. These are big generalizations, but it's a one-way road. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, there are huge num books are printed in huge numbers, but whenever a book is published in America, in England, in France, usually in a very short span of time, that book is being translated into Turkish. So if you are interested, if you're an avid reader, you can find that book, it's just out there. Whereas here, it's more difficult to reach, not only this generation, but also as you move back in time. We had great, great authors, you know, all the way back to the Ottoman Empire and poets as well. Uh, very few of them have been translated. The Bastard of Istanbul, uh, an extraordinary reaction in Turkey. How did you deal with that? I think there were two very different reactions inside Turkey. On the one hand, the one coming from readers and mostly women readers was amazingly positive, you know, very moving from you know, women from all kinds of backgrounds, different classes, different ethnicities, very warm, welcoming response. But at the same time, um, there was a reaction from more smaller ultra-nationalist groups and eventually they sued me um, for insulting Turkishness because we have Article 301 in our constitution and the article is there to protect Turkishness but it's quite vague, you know, what, what exactly that means, where do you draw the line, it's open to debate and at the time there were lots of trials like this. The interesting thing, thing about this trial was for the first time fictional characters, you know, the words of fictional characters were kind of taken out of the text and used as evidence to prove that the writer was insulting Turkishness. How does that feel for you to actually be on trial? It, it was a very awkward, uh, unnerving, if I may say, time in, in my life. On the one hand, I, I didn't feel um, really bad because because of this connection with the readers, that was, that was amazing and, and the book was being widely read, discussed. But at the same time, of course, you know, when you see your pictures on the streets and, you know, people uh, demonstrating um, yeah. with their pictures, that was, that was sad for me. It was, it was a sad time. So it was, I, had, I had hugely mixed feelings. I'm sure, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you actually been involved in the development of the London Book Fair programme, both the cultural programme and the market focus? Yes, with the British Council I have. I have. Uh, we had very uh, productive, very nice meetings throughout the year before. And also I have been, um, you know, I have had lots of dialogues with the Turkish branch of the, of the British Council, the, the people working in Turkey. I have a lot of respect for what they're doing. And I think it's, it's very important that they bring out all these voices together um, so you've helped shape that somewhat of you for, for... I can't say I have helped, but uh, in my own way, I, I'm supporting very much. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. How much difference do you think the London Book Fair Market Focus Programme will make in the short term and over time? I think over time, um, obviously, you know, when I, when I look at the, the wider world, 
these developments are very small, you know, what we do here, um, somewhere else, all these intercultural, interliterary dialogues. Um, sometimes it's depressing because, you know, the world in the meantime is being shaken by other political developments, ideological developments that are based on more polarization. But I do believe what we're doing here is very, very important, you know, to hear each other's voices. We don't know each other that well. We don't read each other's literature that well. To me, that is very precious. I believe one of the things that literature does best is to cultivate empathy. And a world where empathy shrinks, diminishes, is a terrible world. Um, to me, it's amazing to see, you know, when Arab and maybe um, Jewish politicians get together, they don't listen to each other anymore because it's, it has become so repetitive. You know, everybody's saying the same things over and over again, but still an Arab reader reads a novel written by a Jewish author. A Jewish reader reads a poem written by an Arab poet and they connect with that character. They connect with that voice. This is happening everywhere, locally, nationally, internationally. So the London Book Fair and such encounters, cosmopolitan encounters, are very precious in my eyes. How are you spending your time at the fair as author of the day? So I have um, panels, I have talks, um, I have meetings with my editors, publishers. I'm also looking forward to hearing questions. I love that, you know, questions, comments from readers, uh, interactive events are, are my favourite events and panels. So I'm very much looking forward to all of that. Elif Shafak, many thanks. Thank you.